Welcome to the Uncountry Truth Podcast with my special guest, Nick. Can you please tell the audience a little about yourself? Absolutely. Uh, my name is Nick Klingensmith, and I'm with Stride Motivation. I'm a four-time cancer survivor. I'm a type 1 diabetic. I'm a recovering alcoholic. I have seven herniated discs, nerve damage, sleep apnea, and I defied it all when I became an obstacle course racer. Now I'm a motivational speaker and mindset coach, just sharing stories of resilience. Mm. You must have been going through a lot of pain over the years. Yeah, but maybe not the kind I recognized, you know? There's the physical pain, but there's the emotional pain of going through all that shit. Yes. And for the longest time, I was in this victim mindset, you know? I just kept, all this stuff kept happening to me and happening to me and happening to me. And that is a painful place to be when you allow yourself to feel so victimized. Yes. Um, what um, most people with problems like that, they turn to opioids. Like, did you have any problem with opioids? You know, I, I surprisingly did not. And when I say surprisingly, because when I had my shoulder surgery in 2006, um, I had nerve damage and it was like uh, they, they did something with the ulnar nerve and the amount of pain that I was in for so long. So I was taking like probably six pills a day. Mm -hmm. for like 90 days straight and then when it was like i woke up and the pain was gone and so i was like okay i can manage this with ibuprofen now mm -hmm. and so i was very fortunate because i'm an addict so it's probably only a matter of time till something like that could have taken over yes and then and like those kind of pains they give you oxycontin they give you percocet oh yeah um, they it's nerve pain they give you the real mccoy yeah yeah 30 30s <laughs> yeah the high ones uh, I just met somebody the other day. They's like, they're going, they're going to do their pain management now, and they, they're so happy, they're so happy. They like, yeah, I'm getting, getting Percocet thirties. Like, I said, yeah, you, you really excited about that? <laughs> like, you're very happy about that. <laughs> I'll tell you, I was too. You know what was actually a trip up for me is the doctor I had back then. He helped me. He write the script to make sure I was able to maximize what insurance would get for me. So. I mean, is there another definition of drug dealer <laughs> than that? Like that, I can't think of and. You know, I was appreciative at the time, but of course, it's like your doctor's giving it to you. This is 12 years ago. I'm naive. I'm getting what I want, you know, and now I remember when I got in another car accident about uh, seven years ago. Um, wow, it was that long ago? You know, I have seven herniated discs. I live in physical pain. I have mm -hmm. not had a pain level less than six in 20 fucking years. Mm -hmm. But now to try to get a, a pill is so much harder that... Mm -hmm. Like it's eye opening, you know, when it's good to know because I don't need them anymore. Mm -hmm. Whereas yeah. back then for the pain, like I needed it. And it was my go to. If my discs were acting up, I need Percocet. Like mm -hmm. I don't remember the last time I've taken one. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're so right about that. Um, I, I did a process where I was getting pain management and then um, I injured my back. So I went to a different doctor and when I went to the for up for pain management again, and when she seen my record, she just started bringing up the old stuff. Like and I said, why you keep bringing that stuff up? And I didn't want to talk about it. I didn't want to talk about it. You know, and she just kept bringing it up, kept bringing it up. Like, was it fraud? Snap, snap. Were you in this pain? Did, did you get these because you was in pain? Or were you just getting them just to sell them? Like, like she was asking me so many questions. I'm like, look, I don't want to ask none of these questions. I just never went back. Because I feel like she was trying to get me go to jail or something. <laughs> it's I'll tell you, it, it's a tough thing because you you don't want them like patient is exhibiting drug seeking behavior and then nobody prescribes you anything ever again. And yeah. it's a stigma that I mean, the thing is, is this right? Like there should be a stigma mm -hmm. upon opioid abuse. Mm -hmm. There should not be a stigma upon pain. Mm hmm. And you shouldn't feel bad that you need help. You know, if you're going out there looking for those pills, just those pills, mm -hmm. there's a good chance you're just trying to get high because yeah. there's a lot of different ways to relieve the pain. But when you're asking for help, you shouldn't have to feel bad about that. And it's unfortunate that I'm just going to say like, well, for lack of a better word, society has allowed it that these things are just getting flooded out into the market and when again mm -hmm. they're being prescribed by doctors people yeah. that we were supposed to trust yeah yeah I, yeah she had my mri she, she seen my three the, the, um three distorted discs she seen the um the fluid in my legs 
but she said the fluid in my leg was enough to um drain. She said it might like dissipate by itself over the years, and which it did. My leg don't hurt no more. And I used to um also stand a lot. I was a dog walker, and I also was a, um a dog trainer. So I even walk the dogs outside. Or I was inside with the dogs um for eight hours a day, nine hours a day. So I was always on my feet. So my legs kill me and um swell up. I can't bend it. I can't bend it at all. Always in pain. Can't sleep because my leg is throbbing. Like I say, it's pain. The pain was like an eight. It was so much pain. And um, but once she seen my record from the past pain, pain management, she would not let that go. She would not let it go at all. To the point I had to, I had to just like, yo, forget it. I, 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 I'll just deal with the pain. And eventually it just disappeared. And like, I don't have no pain in my back no more. I don't have no pain in my leg no more. And I, I'm glad I never got the pills either because I probably would have got addicted to them or something. I mean, she probably did you a favor. Yes, exactly. Um, I see your medals. How many medals you got back there, man? A couple hundred? Uh, it's probably like 150, give or take. Um, there's 97 Spartan races, six major marathons, and about, uh, well, we're just going to say 50 other mm -hmm. uh, obstacle races, endurance events, 5Ks, 10Ks, half marathons, stuff like that. Yeah. My sister my sister did the Special Olympics several times, so she got a party like 30 medals from doing a Special Olympics. Oh, no shit. Yes. What event or events? Um, I, know, I know, I'm not sure because this was years ago. Um, but I, like, she just moved, so all her medals, her medals are hanging right here on the light. It's gone now, so, all right, so I can't, I can't even tell you. Um, but um, she's blind. Yeah. Oh shit. Yes. Um, one of the things about obstacle course racing has given me, I'm just gonna say visibility to is <clears throat> just how badass some of the adaptive athletes out there truly are. Um, and I mean, there are blind racers and obstacle course races. This is not a playground. You know what I mean? This is a mountain or like, these are dangerous places to go. Like you're not on a road. <laughs> like the trails are barely marked as it is. The only thing that creates the trail are the people who run through it. And yet, you know, there are adaptive athletes, like all sorts of people with disabilities. I mean, technically as a diabetic, I'm out there with a disability, but it doesn't feel that way when I'm able to walk on my own, when I can see on my own, when I can hear my own things that, you know, you, we, I think we take for granted too much every single day. Mm -hmm. um, blindness runs in, blindness runs in my family. So my, my great grandma was blind. I got uncles that's blind. My sister's blind. I got um, aunts that's blind. Um, so it runs in my family. Um, Calyrex and stuff like that. Um, but like I noticed my sister is very functional. She I mean, she do everything. She cooks, she cleans, she do her laundry, she take her daughter to school, she take her daughter up from school, she rides the train, all this stuff. But like the older ones, like my uncles with that, they can't do nothing by themselves. Or they're afraid to do it by themselves. And I noticed that. I think because she's younger than what happened when she got blind. She was younger when she got blind. Like I think she was like 16. And my uncle and everybody else was in it. And my uncle was like, what, 50 years old, 40 some years old when he got blind. My great grandmother lost her eyesight because she was old. She died at like 110, something like that. She lost her eyesight when she was like 80, I think it was. You know? Yeah, I mean, that would be something too tough to adjust to for sure when you're so used to a certain way. I mean, as adults, if you want to continue to grow and develop in your life, you, you kind of accept that you have to relearn certain things anyways because... I mean, just talking about myself here, even with physical endurance, like I'm 44 years old. I'm turning 45 this year. Mm -hmm. My body is not making this easier on me. And so I continuously have to adapt to, you know, changing circumstances and stuff like that. But yeah, that would be, I mean, to, to, I just, I always consider myself very fortunate despite all the things that are wrong with me. There's very little that can hold me back. Yes. And I think about my age and stuff like that. I always think about that old TV show. I forgot what it's called, but remember, it was a like a puppet with a rabbit. It was a puppet, and the guy lived in the basement. It's like a like a it's like a spin like a a, a spoof of um, Married with Children, and the guy lived in the basement with a bunny rabbit, and the rabbit talked to him. Um, <laughs> I don't think I know this one. Um, I, I, it's an episode when they at a diner, and he bends down, and we put his back on. He go, ah, <laughs> he's like, that's when you know you old. <laughs> You make that noise. So every time I bend down and get back up, I always make a noise. And I always think about the <laughs> TV show, that episode. <laughs> I'm just thinking about it. It's like, 
I mean, I'm kind of dealing with a few issues right now, but usually I'm running 30 to 40 miles a week and I do a lot of physical activity, but I mean, the rest of the time, like, I mean, every time I get up, it takes me 10 minutes of moving around. And I mean, every time I get up and I'm mm -hmm. done with this conversation, I get up, like, it's going to take me a few minutes of moving around for my body to stop aching again. <laughs> like it's, and I think that's, uh, I mean, that there's a lesson there that we, we need to keep moving. Yes. You know, it's like, we get more and more sedentary and we hear people talk about it all the time, but it's not like this go, go gym, bro hustle that like, it's no, you're, you're, we need to keep moving or things just are going to stop working the way they're supposed to. Yeah. My mother always says never claim stuff. So never claim you sick and stuff like that. So you mentioned that you, um, a full-time cancer survivor, a type one diabetic and a stream of course athlete. Which of these challenges has been the most difficult to overcome? And how did you find the resistance to keep going? Interesting. So I had been through a lot, but what I've come to realize is that before I became an obstacle course racer, I had not overcome my adversity. I hadn't overcome any of it. Mm -hmm. I had only survived it. And through obstacle course racing, I began to learn how to defy it how to do things that supposedly held me back. And I began to adopt this mindset, like a rebellious teenager, you know, being told no. I'm like, oh yeah, motherfucker, let's just see. And so my attitude changed from that of a victim to, you know, that of this growth mindset, that of this I'm capable and can do anything mindset. Mm -hmm. And throughout that journey is where I began to continue to learn other things. And so when I wrote my book and I published my book, even throughout that process, think of it just like journaling over and over and over and over again. You begin to strip away the bullshit that you've been telling yourself. Mm -hmm. You begin to strip away all the excuses and all the fears and all the ego things that you put out there. And you start to see things how they really were. And it's scary at first to be that naked and that vulnerable. But all of a sudden you start learning all this stuff and it no longer has this fear over you or control over you, right? So then I spent the last two years with people reaching out to me after my book's been out there and sharing their stories. And as I do, I just become increasingly stronger. Yeah. And now I use vulnerability as a superpower because I share the things that I go through and I share the fears that I had and ultimately how I overcame them. And so I tell you that because the hardest obstacle to overcome out of any of it, it's not cancer, it's not alcoholism, it's not diabetes, and it's not off of course racing, it's mindset. It's our own mindset. We live in prisons that we create. Mm -hmm. We have the key and we tuck it under the bed because we don't want anybody else coming in. But the over the hardest thing in order for, for people to overcome is the bullshit we tell ourselves why we can't do more or be more. Yes. That always come up. Mindfulness always come up in these uh, in these Zoom interviews, no matter who I'm interviewing, a psychologist, a psychic, uh, um, athlete, no matter who I interview. Mindfulness always comes up because it's most it's one of the most important things in life that people don't notice or realize it's important. I mean, especially these days, it's it's so easy to be reactive. Mm -hmm. um, there's all the world's information is available to us at a fingertips. Um, we have 97 different social media apps that all do the same thing. I mean, I'm literally mm -hmm. re responding to the same person on three different platforms sometimes. And yeah. I appreciate them like, you know, bumping my mm -hmm. stuff up, but I'm like, mm -hmm. How often are we doing that? All these different platforms, all these red dots are popping up, right? Like everything is reactive where back in the day, now I'm guessing I got a good decade or two on here, but uh, back then, man, if you wanted to like go do something, you had to go to the library and research it. You had to figure it out. You needed some sort of old person in your life to cue you in on what the next step was. You know, you had to be intentional and purposeful and proactive if you wanted to do something besides, you know, working in the family business. I'm, I'm like thinking of like a 1970s movie right now, but you get the point. If you want to get out of that small town, you had to be purposeful. Now people live in this, this global social media economy and I'm not knocking social media. I'm just saying we have all this stuff out there. It's so easy to just let everyone else lead mm -hmm. and we aren't developing our mindset anymore. And instead, we're, since we're being reactive, Half the people agree with you, half the people don't, mm -hmm. and we end up shrinking and becoming more and more defensive of the things that we thought we believed about. So mm -hmm. mindset is everything, and you have to be able to overpower 
you have to be able to overpower what's easy. Yes. And I'm not just saying this in a do hard shit, but seriously, what's easy is to listen to other people's opinions and accept them as your own. Mm -hmm. You know, what's what's easy is to take the headline and not read the article. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's easy to just say I fall into doubt and it's easy to fall into anger and to blame and excuses. There's nothing that even when I started obstacle course racing, there was like an obstacle that I just sucked at so bad. And when I heard other people complaining about it, I'm like, thank God, because it validated me. Yeah. Why did I want to be validated as a fucking <laughs> loser anyway? Like, I, why shouldn't I gravitate towards the people who are completing the obstacle and learning how they're doing it? Mm -hmm. instead of gravitating towards the lowest common denominator and just constantly accepting less from ourselves than we're capable of doing. Yeah. Listen, I like my creature comforts. All right. Like I'm not a go hard all the time guy. I'm not Goggins. Like there's a time when I want to hit tap out and relax and I'm going to like, I'm going to chill with my wife at some point this weekend. We will binge watch something on TV. I have no shame in doing that, but that's not my default position. That's my reward. Mm hmm Yes, you're so right about that. People do what's easy, and that's hard. Like, I like, um, always when people, when topics like this come up, I always mention Kevin Hart, um, what he said on Joe Rogan. He says, it's easy to be angry, but it's hard to be nice. And do you agree with that statement? Yeah, <laughs> it is. I mean, it's, you know why, too, right? It's because you got to put yourself, you got to not put yourself first. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Like, we are selfish by nature. We're, and, mm -hmm. you know, we're... <clears throat> What starts off as self-preservation, which is something that's just ingrained in all of us, it becomes like selfish behavior. So it's yeah. it's hard to just simply put someone else first. Like, and I talk about that all the time. And I am not like a it doesn't come that it doesn't come any more naturally to me than it does anyone else. I have to make a deliberate, purposeful action to do it. But you know, there is no better remedy for than for the blues than than helping someone else. There is no better remedy for depression, for anger, for when we're stuck in a rut than just getting your mind off yourself and helping another person. Yes. Yes, like, because people, I think, I think people are delusional when it comes to stuff like that because, like, a person could steal from you and feel like they're in the right. Yep. When, you try, when you approach them on it, uh, when, you, um, when you call them out on it, and, like, I'd be looking at them like, you serious? Like, you just stole. <laughs> like, like, you're wrong. Just say you're wrong, apologize, overturn what you stole. Don't, don't keep going like, I did something to you. You stole. Mm -hmm. It's like, what does that person's actions have to do with yours? Mm -hmm. exactly. Like, hey, that person screwed me over. They're a douchebag. Now mm -hmm. I'm going to go be a douchebag. And mm -hmm. I get it. Revenge makes you feel better for five or six seconds. But it, it is. But it's usually not revenge because most people aren't really out to hurt the other person. Mm -hmm. You know, where they just want they just want the other person to be hurt. Mm -hmm. Yes. Which, um even worse because you're not hurting them. <laughs> like I just go hit them, get it over with instead of like resenting them internally forever. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I had a former employee that reached out to one of my past guests. So I'm saying mad nonsense is about me. Oh, my business is fake. Um, um, I'm racist. Um, I hate Spanish people. And the person that they sent it to was Spanish. And so like, you don't know, me and this person got a good relationship ever since my interview. Like, I tried to teach the person how to edit videos. Um, let me see, what else? Um, and I also sent my, um, my, my Zen business document showing my business is real. So, and like, she's like, I knew, she's like, I knew that person was lying. This and that. So I was just shocked that the person sent it because I was like, oh, I know that person. And I was like, thank you. I was, like, you so, I was like, you really are a real one to send this to me and let me know what's going on. Because I didn't know. I was asleep. I was asleep. I just, my phone, I heard my phone ring. I looked at it. I, I see it and I was like, huh? Like, I'm like, I'm like, I can't believe this. Like people try to destroy you and like, it's like delusion. It's like delusion. You know, people can't keep up. will always try to slow you mm -hmm. down. Yes. It's just how they want to feel more comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, that's it. They want to be validated when something is too hard. They want to be validated yeah. when something doesn't agree with them. Um, and I get that. And you know what? Like, the trolls don't matter, man. Yeah. Like they don't because the person who's going to believe the trolls, who's going to care about what they have to say, ain't buying your shit anyway. Yeah. It's yeah. the message I'm trying, the message I have to deliver is for the person who needs it and wants it. Yeah. You know, like it's not for everybody. I'm not for everybody. I don't need to be for everybody. And you mm -hmm. can tune me out today and tune in tomorrow and I might be saying the thing that resonates with you. So it's like, 
I'm gonna keep putting it out there and Yeah. So I also felt they was hurting me because they put my real name out there. I'll tell you, I tell you about my real name. It's not a problem. When more voice does as a stage name, it's the it's, it's a TV name, it's like how like um like like The Rock, you know, is is it's a stage name. No, I got no problem. My real name is Taquan Davis. It's not a problem. But I guess she felt person that started us like felt like they was poisoning me, like felt like it was gonna hurt me and or it was gonna make me feel bad, but no, it didn't at all. <laughs> Well, the uh, the second chapter of my book opens with me getting thrown out of a Las Vegas hotel after trying to bang a hooker in a broom closet while my girlfriend slept down the hall. So there's really not a lot I'm worried about people coming out and saying about me. <laughs> yeah, I, I did what I call the eight mile defense. Remember eight mile? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, go ahead and tell them what they don't already know about me. Like, <laughs> like, come on. But I mean, it has to because otherwise in my story and the people I'm trying to reach and people I want to help this stuff that I do here, mm -hmm. nobody's going to care about that. If I'm not open about the other part. Yeah. 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 You're so right about that. Cause I already told that person that she, that, that they sent that message to already knew about that person. They knew about the whole story, uh, why me and that person wasn't getting along and stuff like that. You know? So like, all you did is like prove my point of what, what I said, what I said about it. And I, and I didn't bad mouth the person. I didn't say nothing bad about the person. And the only thing I said was the truth. You know, which the person stole stole a laptop and a hard drive, and she scammed me out of four hundred fifty dollars. That's true. It's a fact. I got the text messages to prove it. I got the text messages to prove it. So, like, how am I lying about this? But you telling people I'm racist and stuff like that is blatantly lying. It's basically um, defamation of character. You know, you're trying to make me look bad. You're trying to destroy my business. You're trying to destroy my reputation. You're trying to stop me from getting guests on my podcast. Let's talk about your book. Um, the book is called Through the Fire Chronicles. Your journey from battling um, grave health challenges to conquering obstacles courses. What, um, what was the turning point in life when you decided to take control of your circumstances and pursue a life of adventure and resilience? You know, it was... I had been obstacle course racing for about seven months, mm -hmm. eight months, and my life was going through significant positive changes throughout that process. Mm -hmm. And then I was in a car accident and it was a, it was a fatality accident. Obviously I'm not the one who died. Mm -hmm. um, I was hit from behind. The other person didn't make it. Uh, I was badly injured. I got several more herniated discs. I had nerve damage. The same day my cat died. Like there was the bottom just fell out beneath me, you know, and I had all these things going for me in life and I had felt better about myself. And all of a sudden I felt it being taken away. And I had told you that moment or earlier that before I became an obstacle course racer, I had not overcome my, my challenges. I had not overcome my adversity. I had only survived it. And I'm standing outside one morning and I'm trying to decide, you know, I, I'm getting back into training, but I'm not motivated and I'm feeling like a victim again. And it was storming out. And I lived on the water. I mean, it was really like movie-esque. And I'm just kind of watching the storm roll in towards me. And I, I realized at that point that I was tired of surviving. Mm. That I was tired of just being a survivor. That there's no, that's not what life is, you know. And you can only be a survivor if you've been victimized to begin with. And I said, I'm not going to live this way anymore. Fuck this. Mm -hmm. I was like, you know what? No, no, I am not a survivor anymore. I am a fucking warrior. Mm -hmm. My life is hard. My life is meant to be hard. More bad shit is going to happen. What am I going to do? Am I going to cry and recoil every single time that it does? Mm -hmm. No, I'm going to defy everything that stands in my way. I spent my entire life doing the shit that people said I couldn't. I had built my way from paying my way through college to, you know, starting my career, I had been able to get through hard shit. And I was just tired of hiding in the corner saying, don't hurt me. And so mm -hmm. that was the moment that I made a decision. And for the next 18 months, my entire life was about defying things. The, the more hurt I got, the more I raced, the harder it was, the harder I went. I had to know that I could go through hell and come out the other side. And that's where the title of the book comes from. I had been in the fire my entire life. And I wanted to know what it was like on the other side. 
And so I made a decision that day to go through the fire and that's, that's what happened. And that's what's how I spent the last seven years. Okay. Um, how do you find the strength to overcome addiction and transform your life? And what advice would you give to others who are struggling with similar challenges? Uh, with addiction, for me, it was surrendering to a higher power. Mm. Um, I had been self-reliant my whole life, like I had just talked about. And the thing about addiction is it, it hides it hides from you when your superpowers become your kryptonite. You know, mm. when you're in the throes of addiction, I'll give you an example. Like, I could drink a lot. I was mm -hmm. highly functional. You know, I would drink three to four times as much as anyone else and be highly functional. But there came this point where all of a sudden that was no longer true. I started mm -hmm. blacking out more, started forgetting things, oh, blacking out more, started just making worse and worse decisions. But you don't see yourself in that moment, you know? And so when, for me, it was, I was lucky to hit a public bottom, that, that hooker story. <laughs> um, I was supposed to be a speaker at the conference the next day. And instead I'm thrown out of the hotel and I had to fly home. I needed that very public bottom for me to decide mm -hmm. that I didn't want to live that way anymore. So I needed to surrender to a higher power that I call God and that higher power wants a better life for me. I don't need to try to run the universe anymore. And that's something that's been very hard for, for me because for the longest time, again, that was a superpower for me, but it began holding me back from what I needed to do going further. So understanding that you are what got you here. You cannot solve a problem in the same paradigm of which it was created. So for anyone struggling with addiction, get help. Mm -hmm. So many people have gone through it. So many people continue to go through it. Like you don't have to follow any one sort of type of advice. I'm not advocating to anyone anything other than the fact that they do not have to live the way that they are living. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I just quit smoking weed and I'm like 33 days clean and my body was, um, that's what I was going to talk about earlier, and I lost my train of thought. Um, I'm going to say never claimed nothing. And ever since I started smoking, I've been, my body was so weak, where like, I always want to lay down. I got no appetite. I don't want to eat. Um, if I do eat, I can't eat a whole plate of food. I'll probably take a couple bites, stop. Take a couple more bites, stop. A couple more bites, stop. And, um, and I still, um, today is the first day I ate a whole plate of food. And I, I guess because I passed my 21 days, and now my body is getting back to normal. What do you think about that? I don't know much about it. Like I've never, I've never been, I don't smoke. So yeah. I, uh, so you don't think it's the same as alcoholism? You know, the thing is I was not an all the time drinker. Like uh -huh. we have something that we talk about called yet. Like I didn't have these things happen yet. So mm -hmm. yes, I used alcohol as a physical crutch, you know, help name numb anxiety, but I wasn't like, is he drunk? I, I didn't drink every day. Mm -hmm. I didn't get drunk every time I drank and bad things didn't happen every time I got drunk, mm -hmm. but my behavior was shitty all the time mm -hmm. and my decisions were still based around alcohol. I just didn't necessarily have the same physical addiction yet Okay. that others had, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And for me, it was definitely more of the mental obsession and mm -hmm. when I was able to, but I mean, if I had continued to drink, it was not going to get better. You know what I mean? It's a progressive disease. Addiction is progressive. So the longer I stayed out there, more of the bad things would have happened. And I probably would have had to go through some sort of a physical transition as well. Yes. Um, I, I was always a social drinker. I never liked drinking because drinking is never like never addiction in my family, like like blindness um is, where like I could I could probably count at least a dozen of my family members who died because of over drinking. Either they got getting, getting green, or even they just got their body got paralyzed, and eventually they just passed away. And I, and I, I probably count about probably like at least twelve people that in my family that did that. So I never really liked it. I always felt like it was a disease that was plaguing my family, especially the men in my family. Why'd you uh Why'd you decide to stop weed? Um, I did it for two reasons. One, money. Um, just just taking too much money out of my pocket. I get paid. I get paid, and let's say no. I realized I spent three hundred dollars on weed, or four hundred dollars on weed in that in that um in that month, or two hundred dollars in a weed and weed in that week. So and I sort of added it up. And um, uh, one time I came up to like I came up to like three thousand dollars a year. One time I came up to five thousand dollars a year. Um, it's and it's it was getting cheaper and cheaper now. So I'm in New York. New York is legal, and it's everywhere. 
You can go to the corner store, you can buy weed. You can go to a dispensary and buy weed. You can go, you can go on the street and buy weed. Hmm. Uh, you can buy weed inside the train station now. <laughs> like everywhere you can buy this. So I think I feel like it's um they trying to like they trying to brainwash the masses. They're making it seem like, okay, yeah, it's legal, yeah, but it's not the same thing that y'all were smoking 10 years ago. That's the same thing y'all were smoking 20 years ago. This stuff, like, I feel like it's it's fake, it's artificial, and I, I don't want to keep putting it in my body. So this is why I stopped. Makes sense. Mm-hmm. You you do notice, like, a physical change now, like, on the positive side? like Yes. Um, now I'm down 33 days in, I, I feel much better. Like, um, like I said, first, today's the first day I ate a whole plate of food. Um, yesterday, I, I couldn't eat a whole plate of food. The day before that, I could eat a whole plate of food. But, um, I eat breakfast and I'm and even right even right now. I can eat probably right now. Um, I got my appetite back. Um, so I'm just waiting. I'm just waiting for that part. Um, I haven't been sleeping though. That's another thing. I haven't been sleeping. So I have like I haven't been sleeping yet at all. So um, I I left here yesterday. Um, doing work on my um on my company, and then um I stayed up all night editing the video, editing the video. Um, I get to finish that to like two thirty in the morning, and then um at two thirty I came here to set up for the podcast. Um, and once I finished setting up, I made the questions for you, my, my previous guests I had, um, and, and, and I haven't been asleep yet. So I'm, um, do this interview with Drew. Once I finish this interview with Drew, I got like, a, like an hour and a half for my next interview. Um, and those back to back. Then I got, then I got like another, um, probably two, two hours off, um, for my last interview. And I'm, uh, um, I, I'm trying to take a little, take a little nap in between there. And then, um. At six thirty, my last issue at six thirty, and that's gonna last about to like seven thirty, eight o'clock. And once that's finished, I'm gonna try to get some real, real deep sleep. Cause um, I got this read tomorrow, but it's not until like I think it's like not until like four o'clock in the afternoon. So yeah. I, I got enough time to get 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 rested, get real, real, get some real rest. Yeah. Um, let me see. My next question for you is um, um, you 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 um, as a four time cancer survivor, you face mortality head on. How has this experience shaped your perspective on life? And what lessons have you learned about living each day to your fullest? You know, the same thing before. Um, I looked at it like, like I was a victim. You know, like I tried to make light of it, but it, it just, for the longest time, first of all, I've never, I've never been afraid to die. Mm. Not like I want to, but I don't look at, like, oh my God, I might die. I'm like, okay, I might die. Like that life is so fragile that you can't get hung up on. It's a waste of time and energy to get hung up on mortality. You have to accept your mortality and just live your life. And again, as being a, someone in recovery and being an alcoholic, like I've been practicing day to time living for 10 years now. Mm. And there's, you know, yes, you want to plan for the future, but you can't live in the future. Um, And we have to live for today. It's all we have. It's all anybody has. Um, You know, a lot of times I talk about the fact that you could fucking die today, but don't forget everyone else, you know, could too. Mm -hmm. So it's important just to be intentional with your time and to be purposeful with your time. You know, I mentioned earlier, like I'll take definitely some, some binge watching of something or relaxing this weekend, And that's okay. I'm not like hiding from the world. That's like relaxing with my wife. You know, we do active stuff too. You know, if somebody, I don't, if somebody just wants to like binge watch football on the couch on Sunday, it's one thing if that's where their interests are. It's another if they just don't know what else to do with themselves. So I will definitely say that I know how to use my minutes. There's very rarely a day where I'm like, oh, I didn't do anything today. And I don't feel good about myself when I did. But I don't have to be like constantly doing stuff. I just have to have a purpose behind what I'm doing. If I'm going to be lazy for six hours, it's going to be because I planned on being lazy for six hours, not because I ignored my responsibilities. Mm -hmm. But I said earlier that I'm I'm experience-driven. And so I just want to experience life to the best I can while I have it. Cause I, I don't want to leave with any regrets. Mm-hmm. Yes, I understand. Um, um, you completed some of the world's toughest obstacle course, course races, including the Spartan race and the Tough Mud- Mudder. What are some of the most memorable moments for these races, and what strategies do you employ to stay focused and motivated during such grueling events? Oh man, you know, 
I love talking about the race that I came in dead last in because mm. I broke my rib. I fractured my rib on mile three of an eight mile race <clears throat> and I completed the race mm. and it was the most painful thing I'd ever endured. It was excruciating. If anybody's ever heard that before or fractured the cartilage of a rib, like it is just grueling pain. Mm. And I don't win these things. I'm not elite. I'm not professional. All right. I didn't have to keep going, but I did anyway. And the reason being is because it was the first time that I raced with fuck cancer across my chest. Mm. You just can't go quitting things when you have fuck cancer across your chest. Mm -hmm. And the reason I tell you that story is because the lesson here is that your why is your everything. It doesn't matter what you're doing. What matters is why you're doing it. What is your purpose for the objective? What is the purpose of what you're doing and why you're doing it for? I love it when people are like, I couldn't do it. You can. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. If I can do it, I guarantee you can do it. It's just a matter of what, why are you doing what you're doing? It doesn't matter what you're working for. It matters why you're working for it. And that applies to every aspect of life. You know, as an entrepreneur, how do you get up every day when you don't know where the next check is coming from? Mm -hmm. You know, where, where nobody owes you this, where all you, all you are anticipating is all the bad shit that you're going to have to weed through throughout the course of the day, right? All the impending disaster and catastrophes. Well, that's what life is. That's what business is. That's what obstacle course racing is. Go into the day knowing that you're going to have to face shit mm -hmm. instead of pretending and hoping it doesn't happen. And if your why is strong enough, you'll get through it. You know, so for me, my, my why is my why applies to my life in a way that makes me a superhuman because my why is to overcome every obstacle and inspire others that they can too. And that's not a metaphor. Whatever I face is just a new challenge for me. And I accept it now as my, it's my responsibility to overcome it and show others that they can too. Mm -hmm. That why gives me a cape. Mm -hmm. That's, I understand that. Um, what are some of the biggest misconceptions people have about cancer survivors? People with type one diabetes and obstacle course athletes. And how do you challenge these stereotypes through your work? You know, the uh, those are interesting questions. I'm going to leave the cancer one alone because cancer is so diverse mm -hmm. and it will attack any of us in so many different ways. And our experiences are also very different, but with diabetes misconceptions, the whole disease is a misconception. And I won't even, I'm not even going to start to touch on the medical aspect because most people don't know shit, but you know what? Yeah, I'm not I, a doctor. I don't, yeah. I don't know nothing about it. <laughs> you know, they're like, yeah. oh, so you ate a lot of sugar as a kid? No, that's not why. But at the same time, there's so much information out there and it's a very hypocritical disease. So mm -hmm. here's the misconception I want to say. If you are a diabetic, and you have a misconception that you can't do physical activity and that you can't do long endurance and that you can't lose weight and that you can't get in shape and that you can't be an athlete because you're diabetic, that is incorrect. If you are under the misconception that it's unhealthy to do these things, that is incorrect. Is it potentially a little bit dangerous? Yeah. It, but so that's what living life is. It's a little bit dangerous. Um, the more, the more we avoid uncomfortable situations, the more we create a bubble around us that eventually becomes a prison cell. So the misconception of saying, I can't do something, that's the misconception. You are the only limitation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I try not to say that I can't do it. Nothing. Like, cause like if, you, if you say that and you keep saying it, you're going to you believe it to yourself. Mm -hmm. and, um, I had an I had a, um, associate at one point and um, he always was negative. Always saying something negative. I'd be like, oh, I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to go climb a mountain. No, nah, don't do that. You may fall off. Like, like, why are you going to say that? Like, why you got to be so negative? It was always, literally, it's everything I, everything I had that man in my mouth was negative. And like, it's to the point where I had to just distance myself from him. Cause I'm like, if you're going to be negative every time, every time I say something in my mouth, you can't be around me because I'm positive. And I, I, I believe I could do anything, no matter how difficult it is. And, uh, and I believe I could take it to the highest limits as possible. But he, he always doubted those situations and limit himself. And so he tried to limit me. And I felt like, yeah, you got to get out of my, out of my vicinity. Let me see. Um, you've spoken at numerous events and conferences. 
sharing your story of resilience and overcoming adversity. What are some of the most common questions you receive from your audience and how do you respond to them? Man, it always comes down to kind of what you're asking, right? What are what are the lessons? What does this have to do with this? Because mm-hmm. um, a lot of what I experience is gives me lessons in metaphors, you know, and then some of them aren't metaphors. Um, and so a lot of the questions just have to be about like practical application. And when it comes down to, it's like I said earlier, it is all about mindset. Every one of these medals behind me is about mindset. It was a, a mental barrier, a mental obstacle overcome, you know, that ultimately gets me there. So I like to say that my story is not that unique. I've had a lot of different things happen to me, but there's no part of my story that's a story by itself. I feel like the collective aspects of all the things that I've gone through and then all the things that I've achieved in spite of what I've gone through, I think that's what makes the story. What are some of the most important life lessons you learned through your experience? So I mentioned that your why is your everything. Yes. Failure needs to be experienced. We need to not avoid failure. Failure is how we learn. Failure is how we defy our limitations and open up the world that surrounds us. Number three, get comfortable with the uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Our comfort zones become comfort cells, prison cells that we build around us. Growth is uncomfortable. Experience is uncomfortable. New things, unfamiliar is uncomfortable. But if you do not get uncomfortable, you are stuck in the very small bubble that you created for yourself. Mm-hmm. Set big goals and take action towards those goals. I don't believe in setting small goals. Don't do baby steps. Fuck it. Say, I'm going to go run the biggest, baddest race. I'm going to achieve the biggest, baddest thing because you need an inspiring goal, something that resilience thrives when there's a deep sense of purpose. So bigger goals drive more meaningful action. You are your habits. Every one of these medals, I didn't wake up one day and said, I'm going to do a thousand races. It, every one of the steps became incremental progress from another step. You know, 33 days ago, you stopped smoking weed. What do you think you're going to start replacing those things with? That was one good decision that you made for yourself. So what's the next good decision? What, what good decision is that going to lead to? Good habits are a gateway drug that lead to other good habits. I didn't go on a diet. I just started making better decisions. Mm. keep moving forward no matter what in the face of all adversity keep moving forward because if you stop here you die here yeah you still right about that number eight chase your fears Mm. we'll say face them no chase them Mm. get up right now and go do something that scares the shit out of you Mm. fears are our limitations they are the things that are walls of our growth of our experience I don't know if I know how to overcome a fear. I know how to, but I know how to not let fear prevent me from doing things. I'm really afraid of snakes. And Mm -hmm. these obstacle course races are in swamps and woods and farms. And I'm not going to go hold a snake because I'm really afraid of snakes, Mm -hmm. but I'm not going to let the fear of that snake prevent me from going and doing something that I love. Number nine, everyone needs a wolf pack. Everyone needs a tribe. We are more resilient. We are stronger together. Community and belonging. There's so much divisiveness out there. All, you know, especially just people constantly picking apart the things that separate us rather than focusing on the things that can actually unite us. And we are stronger together. People thrive when they're a part of something bigger than themselves. And it's a self-renewing energy, which leads me to living inspired. And that is how I live now. There is inspiration everywhere. You mm-hmm. just have to look for it. And if you can't see it in someone else, inspire yourself. Get up and go do something inspiring. Do something that you thought you couldn't do. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have to be, I'm going to go run 30 miles today. Try one. Mm-hmm. Try five minutes. Try a five-minute walk. Read a new book. Apply for a class. Get a certificate. Call that person you've been afraid to call. Just do something mm-hmm. that allows you to live your life and get that fuck yeah moment. Yeah. Like um, when, I first started, when I first started smoking, as like I said, my body was so weak and stuff. So I had to like, and I had to say I had cravings. So I wanted it. I had money to buy it. I didn't want to, I didn't want to you know, like stop my, my growth by setting myself back by smoking. Now I'm not going to start over, over again. You know, so I started doing pushups. So, um, so I, I do probably 50, 60 pushups. And let you know my body is so weak now. As I lay down, <sighs> I'm sleeping immediately. <laughs> you know? you know? So, so that's how I, I cope with it. Cause you, you asked that earlier in one of your questions earlier, you know? That's how I cope, you know, 
instead of me keep keep smoking and stuff like that. Like um even yesterday um I was um I was out um editing my video and uh, one of my associates came and he had the blunt in his hand. He like said, "Now I'm good." Like no, I'm good. I'm like, but can you take that over there a little bit? I'm like, I don't want to smell it. Like, and he moved, he moved down away from me. You know, um, and I, I'm glad he did that. He respected my wishes and and walked away from me. Other, there's other people that was around that didn't do that, but they, I also wasn't friends with them. They was just sitting there around and they were smoking. And it was my, it's not my place to be like, hey, move away from me. Yeah. Be, be in a public place, you know. No, that makes sense. I mean, there's there's adjustment periods too, like. You know, I had to avoid certain behaviors and activities for a while after I stopped drinking, and now I can go anywhere and do anything. I just can't drink. Yeah, yeah, I got self control. It's just, um, I feel like, like I said, that's a person I knew, so I feel like I could tell him, like, "Yo, can you um take that over there?" Um, but strangers, yeah, you yeah, had enough I respect to tell him that, yeah. and he had enough respect to do it for you. The other people don't owe you anything. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um. Let me see. You, you mentioned that you was going to have a, a date night with your wife. So my next question is goes towards that. Um, how do you balance your personal life, your athletic pursuits, and your work as an author and speaker? What are some strategies you use to manage your time effectively and maintain a healthy work-life balance? Uh, first is I don't believe in work-life balance. I believe that is <laughs> And it's something that people burn themselves out on trying to achieve. And it's bullshit. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe in a work-life imbalance. And what I mean by that is you have to have boundaries and priorities. So I told you I have five goals. You know, mm -hmm. I prioritize those goals. My number one goal is my sobriety. There is nothing I will allow to interrupt goal number one. Because mm -hmm. without goal number one, there is no goal number two. Mm -hmm. My number two goal is about managing my diabetes, which is really just a symbol for manage, uh, managing my health. And mm -hmm. so everything from diet and exercise have to come number two in my life. And because without my health, there is no number three. So then it's a priority of now I need to make, now if I'm, I'm healthy and spiritually fit, I need to make money. So that's when we start focusing on where are the work priorities for the day. But there's only so much time in a day. I don't believe you have to have balance of shit. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just a matter of priority. So my wife and I spend times on the weekends, you know, we do things together. We'll relax together. Um, it's just part of, it's just kind of part of what, part of what we do. Mm -hmm. Um, but at the same time, you know, even with my work, I could spend all day just cold calling and making prospecting calls and networking and just trying to get a new speaking gig. I can do that every, all day, every day, cause I need more business. But at the same time, then when am I going to edit my videos? When am I going to write my book? When am I going to do the next thing? Mm -hmm. And even though that may not seem as pressing, that's also the work that sparks my my inspiration mm -hmm. and allows me to do the grunt work the rest of the time. So what am I doing after three o'clock today? My creative work. If it's mm -hmm. important, put it on a schedule and abide by it. You know, you have to do what you like least first and focus on priorities because otherwise we gravitate towards the things that we want to do. And if that was the case, I'd be in cap cut and Microsoft Word all day and I wouldn't sell anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I just uploaded a video um, to YouTube today that I edited, like I said, I edited a video last night of just morning rather. And one of my questions for my guest at that, at that time was um, he, had, he, had, he got about five, um, five different streaming shows. He got five different shows on YouTube and other platforms. And plus he a caterer and plus he got a regular job. So I'm like, how do you manage all this? And his answer was, he said, if I get off work, I, I work on one of these, one of these um, shows. If I, um, if I um, do a show, once I got some downtime, I work on another show. He said, he said, he said he hardly edit videos. So I save him most time too. Cause me editing a video, even an hour long video take about probably three hours to edit. Mm -hmm. Cause, cause you got, I'm adding B roll to it. I'm adding music to it. Yeah. Um, and so on. So, so me, me trying to me pausing it, me watching the video completely all the way through, and then stopping it, and then going to the internet and finding what what we were just talking about to add to that video. It, it's to take time and take time. And um, and that guy I told you about that sat down with the blunt. Um, he came back after he finished and sat down next to me. Um, uh, and, and watched the and listened to music on his phone. And I, I I tapped him and I said I said you see how long I've been sitting here. He said, yeah, about two hours. I said, I said, I only did 30, 30 minutes of this video. And that's how far I got, 30 minutes <laughs> in two hours. He's like, that's why I said, now you see how long it takes to edit videos. Like, he's like, he want to learn how to edit. 
So I was trying to teach him a little bit too, you know, because he he really amazed about editing. Um, he do music, um, but he um he used um, Garage Band, I think he said, Garage Band to um edit his music and stuff like that. Oh, nice. Yeah, so he's fascinated by it. So every time he see me with my laptop, he always want to sit next to me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame him. Yeah. All right. Um, what advice would you give to an aspiring obstacle course athlete or individual who are looking to overcome personal adversities? How can they find the strength and motivation to pursue their goals? Comes back right back to purpose alignment. They have to have a strong why. You know why most people set a stupid ass goal of going to the gym for New Year's or something? Because they just think it's what they're supposed to do. All right. It's a dumb goal because if they wanted to lose weight, they would. Right. So what is the purpose? I wanted to lose weight for years. I was 40 pounds overweight and I was like, all right, I'm going to get up and run this week. And I didn't for a long time. I didn't make dietary changes. It wasn't until I found a higher purpose that connects me to it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what is, why do you want to get healthy and fit? Mm -hmm. That's not a destination. That's a description. What is the purpose of it? You know, when somebody's like, there's a, there's a Spartan commercial, or maybe I think it was a Spartan commercial. I don't remember. It was a commercial. might've been a Super Bowl commercial. A couple years old, there's a, uh a a video it's a commercial of like an old guy and he's doing deadlifts with like a five pound kettlebell or something and he's doing deadlifts of like his dog and he's just constantly doing deadlifts of like a small thing mm -hmm. and then towards the end of the video it shows his granddaughter show up at his house and he lifts up his granddaughter like you know like the deadlift you could see throughout the video he was training the whole time mm -hmm. so we could hold his granddaughter mm -hmm. he wasn't trying to get stronger right that's a stupid goal he wasn't just trying to get fit at the dumb goal. It was, he was trying to get strong and fit enough so that he could hold his granddaughter. That's uh, a specific and powerful and timely and tangible goal that he was able to work towards. And I know it's a commercial, but that's what is missing from yeah. other people when they're unable to get off their ass and do something. Yeah. Some people, now not everybody looks at obstacle course race in the way that I do. Some people, it is life-changing for them too. But for them, it's the community and the experience. And that's just them being out there, being physically fit. Um, to me, I need a sense of achievement as well. And so I do uh, pick key races and I focus on my performance. I'm not going to win any of these things. It's about me versus me. Um, but I mean, anybody who to overcome anything, the very first thing that's needs to happen is you need to over you need to decide what am i trying to accomplish here what is my goal how am i going to get past it because for me that's what i had realized surviving cancer what did i do besides stay alive mm. the doctors did it science did it god did it mm. i didn't beat shit so how do i overcome something like that you overcome something that's trying to kill you by living your best life that's deep you gotta you gotta really um, powerful mind. <laughs> I should um, write that one down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it's like, and like what you were talking about. Um, I got my heart broken one time. I got my heart broken, and I was, and I was homeless. I was in a shelter, but the shelter I was in was called the Bill Fund. Really, wasn't able. Um, I, uh, I don't know if they got one on the West Coast or anything like that, but um, they got one in Pennsylvania and they got one in New York. Um, they got a couple in New York, and um, so basically, I wanted to get diesel. So I'm like, okay, my heart broken. I'm gonna get diesel. I'm gonna look good. I'm gonna get all the girls. You know that? So I started um, working out and because they had the gym inside. So I started working out and um, eat, eating a lot. I eat a lot. I get mad sandwiches, eat mad sandwiches, work out, you know, try to build muscle. And eventually um, my, my body was always like this, you know, but it was no change, but I could feel my body always up high and, you know, um, and I stopped because I was in pain and, um, and I always had to get up the next day and go to work for them because um, we work for them for, um, we work for them for six months. Um, six months, nine months to a year, you work for them, and um, you save sixty percent of your check. So um, I left with I left with a little over ten grand. Um, I got a cousin that left with um twenty six thousand. I know a person, I know somebody that left the fifty thousand. Um, so it all depends on how much you save. Um, my cousin gave all his money up, and the other dude was giving all his money up. And then when he finished the program, he still lived there, and he and he's like had regular jobs and stuff like that, and like hustles. He gave them that money too. This is how he had fifty grand. He accumulated. And um, so my cousin that was just mentioned, he um, he was like, your chest, like he said, your body was like that because it was working. So you would have kept doing it, your body would have changed. 
And um, and I didn't take that to heart. And then now you look on TikTok and Instagram, it's a trend now. A guy gets heartbroken, and they say, no, he like the rock. <laughs> um, I mean, so if you think about that, yeah. You seen those videos on TikTok? I, you know what? I probably, I pretty much only watch whatever my wife sends me on TikTok. Okay. Like I follow like 15 people, but I post every day on TikTok. And so she'll usually watch videos and she'll send me like a couple a day that she thinks I'll be interested in. And so she's my TikTok, uh, my TikTok viewership. Okay. Yeah. Um, I had a group chat and they send stuff, I add stuff to it. How do you adopt your training and mindset for different types of dormant races? I mean, I'm always, I'm always training. I don't train for races. I train for life. Okay. Um, and so I'm always, you know, if, if I'm peaking, it just means I haven't been hurt in a while. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm always just trying to train and, and work on whatever work on my weaknesses and, and constantly build towards endurance. So, you know, at this point in my life, um, I'm running anywhere from five K's to 50 K's. And, uh, so I train for longer races and the other ones are just kind of lead ups in between, but I run a lot, you know, 30 to 40 miles a week. I do a couple hours on my incline trainer or doing stairs, um, do strength training twice a week. And I stretch probably 30 minutes a night. And it's just part of my lifestyle. Can you discuss your role of the community in your journey and how has it contribute to your ability to overcome obstacles and achieve your goals? You know, it's funny you mentioned that because community means something different now than it used to. Um, being that, I mean, here we are, you know, 1700 miles apart having a conversation where in the obstacle course racing community, it started with me just sort of sharing my, my battles and I talk shit. So I'm like, yeah, fuck you cancer. Look what I did today. And you know, you just realize that you, you're starting to get people's attention and you're kind of giving some people something to root for a little bit. And as as that sort of developed and as my involvement in the lifestyle developed, I just became part of other communities, primarily social media based. Um, it's a little bit different, though, because these social media communities, I see these people in real life all the time. Okay. You know, like we're not involved in our like day to day a lot of the times, but we see each other on weekends several times a year. That's more than I see some of my good friends. Um, and what I have just found is that by just promoting good vibes and inspiring and motivating others and encouraging and supporting others just creates a self-renewing energy that gives me the fuel to get through any of the tough times. Okay. Um. What are some of the most valuable lessons you learn from your failure or setbacks? How do you use these experiences as opportunities for growth and improvement? You know, I'll look at anything. I review game tape all the time. And obviously that's a metaphor, but I mean, I had a client uh, prospective call the other day where I just thought how I said something stupid. And so I thought about it later and was like, okay, well, we're not going to say that type of thing again. So you, if you if you don't learn from your failures, then you know you're just going to stay a failure. So don't be afraid to make mistakes, but you have to learn and identify why did I make that mistake and how do I avoid doing it again. Also, some failures and mistakes shouldn't be avoided. You know, like I mean, not for nothing, but Major League Baseball players get paid millions of dollars a year to fail seven out of ten times. Yes. <laughs> not, not just dumb. Basketball players, football yeah, players. Yeah, I mean, shit. <laughs> like, that's that's part of the game. It's moving. What, uh, who said it? Was it Churchill? No. Lombardi? Enthusiasm is going failure to failure without, or success is going failure to failure without losing enthusiasm? I don't know, but I would look that up. <laughs> yeah, that's but a good one. Yeah. Well, here's what I want well, to leave behind. Yeah, I want yeah. Nick to be known the guy that helped people. Just okay. that. That I inspired <laughs> people by sharing what I went through and sharing how to go through it. Um, I don't ever want to be like, do I want to be wildly successful in my speaking business? Of course I do. But I don't ever want to be like idolized. It's not about me. It's about the message. And it's about how I can help people with the message. 
Um, I totally agree. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to be idolized either. I just want to leave something for my family. Um, like, I, 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 we grew up. You know, like, we grew up broke. We wasn't poor. We just grew up broke. Um, my mother worked. My mother always worked jobs. Um, sometimes two jobs to support us. Um, but like, she always been a good mother. She never been like violent towards us and nothing like that. She never been hurtful towards us. Always been a good mother, even though she wasn't able to provide for us like other kids had. Um. But she like she did her best. Um, but like I just want to like leave my kids with something that that will go down generation generation, basically generational wealth. I just want to have generational wealth for my kids and my grandkids and my great grandkids. I never had to live the life that I had. You know, I um it was a point in my life where I wore the same clothes to school every day, and um and I was in junior high school. Um, so like and I got bullied. I got bullied because of that. Um, and just and like it's only because I knew how to fight um, that people left me alone. Cause they bullied me, I let it go. Bully me again, let it go. The third time, I I, I fight. After I fight, they leave me alone. Got a bunch of bully in the nose. And, yeah, <laughs> they leave they leave me alone. No, um, but yeah, they was, I was getting, I could get made fun of and picked on. I wore the same clothes every day. You know, so I just want I want my kids to go do that. Um, your journey involves a wide range of achievements. What accomplishments are you most proud of, and why? You know, I talk about that broken race rib race before, but um, running the Boston Marathon was just one of the greatest things I've ever done. Mm -hmm. The uh, it's one of the hardest races to get into. I'm from Massachusetts. I've been to Marathon Monday and like a dozen times, and you know, it, it meant a lot to me to be able to run that race. Mm -hmm. Um, my my grandparents and my cousins and aunts and uncles all grew up on Chestnut Hill, like which is heart you know in the Heartbreak Hill area um of the Boston Marathon. And ever since the bombing, I just, I really wanted to punch back. And that was running the race was how I felt I could. And, uh, yeah, I had never run a marathon before, you know, this was still part of my journey and it was just something I never thought possible. And I ran the race and it was raining the whole time. It was 40 mile an hour headwinds. It was torrential downpour. I mean, it was fucking miserable. It was like 20 degrees out. And, uh, you know, when I crossed that finish line coming down Boylston Street, I mean, it was a, it was a life changing moment for me, and it's it's one that a lot of people don't get to don't get to appreciate. So, it's just one of those things where you start doing awesome things, and then awesome just you just keep doing more awesome things, you know. Because then I came back and I ran it again, and then I ran Chicago, and then I ran Chicago, and then I ran New York, and now I run Berlin, mm -hmm. like the experiences just continue to pile up, but like Boston was a very remarkable and just spiritual experience for me. What you did, at, what you did when the bombing happened? No, no, I, I did it in 2018. Um, oh. The bombing was why I wanted to run it in the first place. Oh, okay. What was Germany like? Germany, you know what? Germany was cool. It's not, a, I don't know, maybe just not a marathon city. Like uh -huh. it was my least favorite marathon to run in um the crowds are okay uh, i was basically dressed up like an american flag um i was wearing my team usa jersey like a uh red and white and blue headband uh my socks were all flagged out and i was actually getting lots of usas usas and they were from the locals though which was kind of cool because they'd come with the yeah. accents but yeah. um in Berlin was unique because I mean you're running around certain like historic sites of the city and you finish under the Brandenburg gates and and stuff like that. But listen, I'm from Massachusetts, so I'm not allowed to say this, but are you from the Bronx or are you from Brooklyn? I'm from Brooklyn. All right. Well, you'll still get this. I'm from Massachusetts, all right. So I can get drummed out of like the Massachusetts Union for saying this. But the Bronx crowd brought their A game. Okay. <laughs> like when I ran New York and I'm coming, you know, I mean, that's what mile 19 or something. I was under trained. I was feeling so sick. I was just fucking dying. All right. And those buildings shook mm -hmm. when you run through there. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that it's hard for the Boston guy to say that the New York crowds gave a rival for like the awesome marathon city, but I loved running in New York and mm -hmm. the crowds were just awesome. And they just give you that, just really fed that energy through. And like I said, I mean, the race starts out, you know, like uh, near Brooklyn or whatever. So you're running the early miles, um, the early miles through Brooklyn and Queens and stuff like that. But so later when you're like just dying and you're like really questioning your life decisions <laughs> and then like 
yeah, the buildings just shook for you, man. And that was just like, that was awesome. Okay. Yeah, I always wanted to see Boston. Like, what's like there? You know, um, Boston Marathon is a different type of course. Well, no, um, New York is point to point too, but um, Boston is a, it's almost like a straight line, but it, it runs through like all the small boroughs that outline Boston. Okay. Um, it's really treated like a hometown race because I mean, the first, I don't know, 15, 16, 17 miles. I mean, you're running just through people's house by people's houses. <laughs> like it's, you know, really like the, the towns. And so people, they, they have these awesome parties on their front lawns and they just come down and support you. I mean, even in that day, there was 750,000 strangers cheering you on in even my wife was out there cheering for like six and a half hours, catching hypothermia just because of the, the energy. But I mean, the bus, like, when I turned on to Boylston Street, which is that last straightaway of the Boston Marathon, I remember just looking up at the crowds and I'm like, man, is this what Tom Brady feels like? Yeah. <laughs> like, this was awesome. Yeah. Um, actually, um, you actually the second person I met from Boston. The first person I met from Boston was a chef at the U.S. Open. He was my head chef at the U.S. Open. And I, um, we was working in the media department in, in, at the U.S. Open. Um, very cool guy. Um, great chef. Um, uh, let me see. Yeah, that's that's pretty much what I have to say about him. Um, I didn't really get to know him really deep because um, I wanted to stay professional. I didn't want to get like personal with nobody. And um, actually, I mentioned that on my uh, on another episode where people would actually joke around with these chefs, joke around with them, and it caused problems between them. Where like they would joke around so much, where now when the chef be hard on them, they they feel like, hey, you my friend. Like, how you how you gonna talk to me like this? Like. But no, he's doing his job. Like you need to stop playing around with the chef. That's all. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's tough when you're a leader and you want to be a man of the people. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, it's such a fine line. And I look back at how poorly I executed that line in the past. Yeah. Because I would be the same guy who's chumming it around with you. And then I'll come by and I'll make a joking comment like about how you're not working hard enough. And then later I lo might lose my shit. And like, they don't know which Nick was talking to them and that's not fair to them. Mm -hmm. Now, some people will gravitate towards you, you know, and they'll, they won't use it to their advantage. They'll, they share that like-minded part, but it's a fine line, man. And managers should not try to become friends. They should make mm -hmm. themselves available. Mm -hmm. I guess leap, you know, when you try to be the friend with the person, like mm -hmm. let them be friends with you, not the other way around. Yeah. Like you're the manager, like care about what they care about so you can support them and help them and guide them to accomplish their goals. But unless they're trying to be your friend, they don't want a fucking buddy. They want to support, they want to hit their goals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'd yeah, rather man. have a manager tell, yell at me and tell me what to do so I can succeed mm -hmm. rather than trying to be all nice about it when they don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, like um, like I said, he was a great chef. His name is Chef Tyler. He worked for Restaurant Associates. Um, he's from Boston. So just in case you ever post it and somebody see it and they be like, I know, I know Chef Tyler. Nice. Hopefully they show him to him. You know, like my, boy, my boy's a chef up in uh, Boston. He actually is part of a project. Uh, I don't know the name of it. Unfortunately, just uh, opened up around Fenway. Um, okay. I guess there's like a couple new restaurant themes. Um, and he is, I don't know if he's the head chef. I don't know his title, but he's he's high up in the project. He's doing a couple of restaurants uh, around Providence and whatnot. Well, just so much good food up there. Yeah, that's what Chef Tyler do. Um, he he basically like a traveling chef. So basically, if um he works for Restaurants Associates, so if Restaurants Associates open a new location, say it's a bank or something like that, they would send him. He would set it up. He would hire the people. He teach people what to do, and then he would move on to another location. And that's what they does. You know, as a speaker for Stride Motivation LLC, what key messages do you emphasize? to inspire others and how do you tailor your talk to resonate with diverse audience? So at the end of the day, the lessons I'm going to share are going to be the same because they are the lessons mm -hmm. and they're always about, they're basically boiled down to lessons and resilience and mindset, community and belonging. And, and as a way of being stronger to push past doubt and to accomplish goals, the stories I might tell might be a little bit different. You know, I might tell my stories through cancer, through car accidents, through personal loss, through recovery. I may also tell stories about how I grew up as a scared little kid from also a child of alcoholic parents, like, and how ultimately I came to overcome fear. You know, as a career salesperson, I try to relate the stories and resilience and how to we can be effective 
in our jobs, but not, not for the job for ourselves. Yeah. You know, like if you get to be the, a button pusher, be the best button pusher you can be for yourself. You know, be your best self in all situations and put yourself in position to achieve your goals. People go to work with the wrong mindset. You know, they think I'm working for the man. I'm working for this guy. No, fuck that. You do not work for the company you work for. You work for you. You work for your goals. I don't know who pays you, but you already told me what your money's about. You don't work for whoever pays you. You work because you want to leave a legacy for your children. So it doesn't actually matter what you're doing, Right how you're working to acquire money, your purpose is still the same. So you're able to do that throughout the day and know like, hey, whether or not I'm sweeping floors, running a business, doing this, that's your end. So for me, again, it's like, I'm going to use it and everything I can at my disposal so that I can deliver a message of inspiration for others. In your journey as a digital creator, speaker, and best-selling author, what been the most unexpected challenge you faced and how did you overcome it? Hmm. What's interesting is that I don't have a lot of expectations. I say that expectations are a killer of happiness. So I'm not expecting successes any more than I'm expecting challenges. I, I'm only expecting challenges. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, I'm not putting demands on the future. I have a vision, I have goals, I have a dream, but I'm taking everything one day at a time as it comes. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's really all you can do. It's, you know, I remember in, a couple of years back when I was working uh, from home and my internet was out for three weeks. Um, so I had to go work at Panera every day. You just okay. gotta make adjustments, you know, everything is an obstacle. Sometimes they're more than others. I had some heart issues last summer. I was in the hospital. Like I still found a way to complete my races, you know, still found a way to get my job done. There's uh there's not all obstacles are going to be unexpected. Yeah. <laughs> so you just got to take them one at a time. And again, remember what you're fighting for. I mean, races you do a year. Uh, it depends. Like I tried to do a lot more in the last two years, but I got hurt this year. I actually don't think I'm going to do as many last year. I thought I was going to do like 40. Um, yeah, that's a lot. I'll mm -hmm. probably do like 20 this year. Okay. Yeah, that's a lot. Um, yeah. what's the, what's the time frames of those? Like every month or every couple of weeks? Like, uh, it, it depends. Go? Like I go in spurts. So like last year I was on a plane, like I literally raced six out of seven weeks. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I might not go anywhere again for two months. So I live in Florida, so there's not a lot down here in the summer, um, you know, but so I'll just try to maximize my travel where I can. I'll be in Jersey, uh, North Jersey. Uh, so close to your neck of the woods up in Vernon yeah. um, at the end of April. Okay. And so what this year I'm focused more on the big events and really just trying to, I, I need to focus on my business. So I'm not going to travel as much. Oh. What race is that in Jersey? It's a Spartan race. It's at Mount Vernon. It's a full trifecta weekend. So I'm doing an ultra, which is a 31 mile race on the mountain. And then there's also a 10 K and a 5 K. Oh, okay. Um, I only got one more question for you and um, then we could close. What future challenges or goals are you most excited about? And how do you plan to continue inspiring others through your journey? I can't wait to get on stage and drop the fucking mic. And I mean that with all that passion. <laughs> I've done a couple gigs, all right, but you know, I want that moment where I know I've got them. Mm -hmm. I want that moment where I just know that I reach people. So I'm gonna keep having these conversations as much as I can. Just gonna keep trying to talk to people. Just can't, trying to keep share. You know, there's a there. Want to know how I know there's a better a better future? How do you know? Because I'm not gonna fucking stop until I get it. You mm -hmm. want to know how I know that everything's going to be all right? How do you know? Because it always has. Mm. <laughs> want to know how? <laughs> like, we're going to succeed because there is no evidence to the contrary. The only way that you fail this game is if you quit in the middle of it. Game don't end until I win. That's amazing. I, I, plan, on, I plan on trying to get like at least five different influencers. I hope you'll be able to join me um, so you can drop that mic. <laughs> Hell yeah, um, man. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, I plan on like getting like, I'm going to try to like, rent like a little like oratorium or something and where like we can sit on stage and the audience can ask <clears> us <throat> questions and stuff like that. So 
I don't like usually people do this. It's like red pill, blue pill talk. I want to stray away from that. So like I'm trying to like like a lot of my a lot of my guests are um former addicts, former um from um um some of them are psychologists, um some of them um or um exercise enthusiasts, um some of them are trainers. So I'm gonna ask these people instead to come and like um have we all sit on the stage. Um, we talk about our recoveries. We talk about our addictions. Um, and talk about um our life and people can ask us questions on how we how we um did this and um, we can sell tickets and um and uh, split the proceeds and try to move on to other things other other renews and other things you know we'll figure it out mm-hmm. that, that's it we'll just keep putting it out there help people along the way and we'll figure it out as we go yes um you, want, you got anything else you got any last words for the audience you know, uh, I do. And here's why. Um, I like that you kicked off this conversation with opiates because it is a bigger part of my story than I talk about. And it's not because I've been hiding it. It's just because it's a small part of my story. But the fact is, we need to out these things. We need to normalize them. We need to discuss them. I can't sweep it under the rugs, right? Yes, I was lucky and I got to quit before it became a real influencing problem in my life. But that was only because I had other dominant problems in my life. And so my advice for anyone is to get into conversations like this, talk to people like you, get this stuff out from behind the curtain, out from our chest, out from our head. It loses power over you. And also I have less places to hide. I can't lie to myself and say, I don't have a problem with something when I discuss the problem Mm -hmm. and then it doesn't have that problem. So, you know, I appreciate, like, I appreciate that. And I just think that we shouldn't be so afraid. And I'll tell you what, the people who are going to judge me, fuck them. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to lose my life because I'm afraid of what somebody else is going to think. And that's what it comes down to with addiction is you are willing to die mm-hmm. before some letting some stranger judge you. That's the wrong way about it. Fuck the stranger, live your life. And then you know what? Let them judge you for being awesome. Very well said. Um, 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 so I'm, I'm going to conclude now. But um, what you were saying was, what you were saying, what you were just saying, is so true because, like, I, like I said, I told you, I told you about the guy that sat down next to me with that. But also, my brother asked me um earlier today about smoking, and I told him like, if I smoke now, the thirty days I just did is useless, and it also would make me a liar, um, if I was to smoke right now. So I said I don't want to do that. Um, I like that because I say that about yeah. myself with the book. Now I have yeah. to live it. Yeah, like I'll be a liar now, and also. Also, like I think the people won't, yeah, y'all won't be able to, know, y'all won't know that I'm doing it, but I will know I'm doing it and it defeat the purpose. So you're so right about that. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Well, hopefully today, maybe there's somebody out there right now who's gonna yeah. be able to yeah. listen to this, listen to your story, listen to mine, and make a better change for themselves. Yes, because like like you said, hopefully people will listen and get it from there. Because y'all, me doing these interviews, talking to people like you, or is keeping me clean. And keep me on the right track and this is why i appreciate all y'all for doing these podcasts with me doing these episodes with me i really greatly appreciate y'all y'all, y'all really are god blessing you know you know, from, you know angels you know sit from heaven like god sent y'all to me for a reason to help me in my journey and i really appreciate that i gotcha mm. all right for watching uncomfortable true podcast with my special guest nick um thank you man i really appreciate you it's been a pleasure being here man thanks for having me all right. have a good day you too man thank you All right, appreciate you. Later. Later.